first attempt to grasp a little bit of hope and somehow contact the lost relatives. And that is how the board was viewed for a long time, just something to give people hope, um, a way to communicate loved ones that have been lost. Um, And as I said before, spiritualism was very big at the time. And if it brought people a little bit of comfort and a little bit of happiness, was it really that bad? I mean, was it? I mean, even if you think the Ouija board is nothing more than a lie, if you believe the Ouija board is just pure evil and shouldn't be messed with, what you've got to remember at this point in time, it wasn't viewed like that. Like I said, it was viewed as a novelty item. So was it really that bad for people to get a little bit of hope and happiness out of it at a time when they really needed it? Well, for all the comfort the Ouija board might have been providing people At this point in history, there was also a lot of strange stories coming to light about the board. I mean, as the board grew in popularity, it started to be used in more ways than just a game. It was also used by self-claimed psychics who believed they could solve crimes by using the board. Uh, Take, for instance, the murder of Joseph Bone Elwell. It was reported that the murder of Joseph Bone Elwell, a successful gambler, was attempted to be solved by certain people using the Ouija board. But ultimately, the crime went unsolved. It was reported that on June 11th, 1920, Elwell was shot in the head in his own locked house. And to this day, his murder has never been solved. Even though many psychics claimed that they know who the murderer was by the use of a Ouija board, ultimately, they all failed. If anything, that story probably tells us that the Ouija board doesn't work or the person using the Ouija board, didn't actually know what they were doing, Uh, but the next documented case probably sways more in the realm of mental health than spiritualism. Um, uh, This case tells of a woman who was committed to a psychiatric hospital for leaving her mother's dead body in the living room for 15 days before burying her in the backyard. The daughter claimed that the Ouija board had instructed her to do what she did, and she was not crazy. Now, some might say that the Ouija board was responsible for this, but I think a lot of people would sway towards the fact that the lady was probably suffering from mental health issues, and she was in fact crazy, even if she stated that she wasn't. um, She probably needed help. The next incident involving a Ouija board took place in 1929 near Buffalo. Leela Jimerson and Nancy Bowen turned to the Ouija board for help in solving the mysterious death of Nancy Bowen's husband. Uh, They claim that the dead husband did indeed make contact. Apparently, the dead husband named his female murderer and gave a description of the killer and address. Leela Jimerson claimed that she actually knew the female killer named Clothfield, and I hope I'm pronouncing these names correctly. Um, It's worth mentioning that days after the seance, Nancy also received a mysterious letter, which informed Nancy that Clothfield was in fact a witch and had killed her husband. This was all that was needed to push Nancy over the edge, as well as the Ouija board seance. Uh, she is then said to have gone out and purchased chloroform and a hammer, knocked on Clough Heald's door and murdered her with the hammer, and then placed a rag soaked in chloroform down her throat for good measure. It turned out Nancy had been set up by her friend, Leela, who was actually having an affair with Clough Heald's husband and simply wanted the woman out of the way. Nancy was found guilty of manslaughter, whilst her so-called friend was acquitted. So that story points more at deception rather than it being um, a supernatural story. Uh, But there was also a similar case in 1933, which tells of a mother and daughter who were sat down to use a Ouija board, whilst her husband and father of the daughter was out milking the cow in Arizona. The board informed the daughter to kill her father when he had finished milking the cows. And shockingly, the mother was very supportive of this idea. When the father had finished milking the cows, his daughter made her move. She took her father's shotgun and blasted him twice in the back, resulting in his death. Two weeks later, it was discovered that the mother had been planning the murder all along, so she could flee with another man and had shockingly set up her own daughter to take the fall. The pair both did receive jail time, but only served roughly three years each. Uh, So, once again, that is also a story of deception rather than supernatural. In 1935 in Kansas, a woman named Nellie Hurd was given information from a spirit whilst using a Ouija board. The board had apparently told her that her 77-year-old husband had been cheating on her and had also hidden $15,000 from her. That night, Nellie knocked her husband unconscious. 
He awoke to find she had tied him to his bed. And then, the brutal interrogation started, to make him confess to something he didn't actually do. She proceeded to stab him, whip him, and burn his feet with hot pokers, as well as threatening to shoot him with a pistol. Eventually, he did confess, although it was a false confession. He did this just to stop his wife from inflicting any more harm upon him. Nelly momentarily left the gun on the bedside. Her husband managed to get out of his binds, grabbed the pistol, and shot his wife, killing her instantly. Rightly so, in court, he was found innocent, and that he acted purely out of self-defence. Now, it seems that the people in these stories were actually using the board as a deceitful tool, or they were genuinely mentally ill. Um, There are many, many more tales of murder and deceit, but the board has also been used to progress people's personal careers as well. Take, for instance, the story of Lenore Curran. It was in 1913 when Lenore Curran claimed to have come in contact with a spirit named Patience Worth, who lived in the years 1649 to 1694 and lived across the sea in England. Lenore claimed that she could see Patience Worth's personal features as well as where she lived in her mind's eye. She described Patience Worth to be around 30 years old, her hair was dark red, her eyes brown and her mouth firm and set. She also claimed that she had visions of Patience Worth travelling to America where she was eventually killed by Indians. Lenore became a popular author with the help of the spirit Patience Worth who apparently gave her all the ideas for her poems and novels. And when I say ideas, what I mean is Lenore said that Patience actually told her what to write. Um, Lenore claimed that communication through the board was a regular occurrence. Eventually, she began to anticipate what Patience Worth was going to spell before the planchette arrived upon the letters. And eventually, Lenore started to claim to be able to see the story unfold in her mind in pictures. She claimed to actually be able to see the characters of the book playing out the scene before her very eyes. And if any of the characters spoke a different language, Patience's voice could be heard translating the language for her. As the years went on, Lenore and the spirit of Patience apparently wrote many, many novels together, including poems as well. And I'll try and link some of Lenore and Patience's books in the show notes if you want to go and check them out, maybe you want to read them. Um, you know, you never know, they might have been written by a ghost. Now, as far-fetched as that story just sound with the spirit writing the books, it is a little bit more plausible than the previous stories, which revolved around deceit and mental health. I mean, because ultimately, we don't know. She might have been telling the truth, we don't know. Um, it all depends how open your mind is. I mean, like like always, you know me, I, I like to keep an open mind, and I like to think that there's a slight possibility that it could have been real. Now, let's get back to a little bit more history on the board, especially the years that the board became more associated with demonic and evil forces. The year was 1973, and a little horror movie was about to hit the cinema screens and cause absolute mayhem. Can you guess what movie it is? I'll tell you. The movie went by the name The Exorcist. Now, the movie is said to be based loosely on actual events. The film tells the story of a 12-year-old girl who becomes possessed by a demon after playing with a Ouija board and making contact with a spirit called Captain Howdy. Once the movie was released, the audience flocked to see it, and that's when the negative reports started to come in. Apparently, people found the movie so disgusting and disturbing that there were reports of people actually collapsing and vomiting, And even more disturbing, people were having miscarriages and even heart attacks in the cinema. A lot of people believe that the movie itself was evil and should not be seen by anyone and should be banned. Uh, People of course still wanted to see the movie and queued in long lines in the freezing weather as members of the church walked the lines urging people not to go and see the movie. In fact, I believe it was released briefly in the UK in uh, in the 80s on VHS and then it was quickly taken off sale until its DVD release in 1999. And to be honest, it's it's not surprising, although nowadays the movie probably doesn't seem that graphic compared to some of the horror movies we see today. Um, there were many disturbing scenes, including the possessed girl using foul language, urinating on herself, uh, the scene where her head spins all the way around, um, 
And of course, the masturbation scene with the cross, which uh, still to this day is quite disturbing to watch. And as I stated before, the the reason for the possession in the film was all because the main character, Regan, played with a Ouija board and invited in the demon, Captain Howdy. Um, I mean, if the Ouija board was ever looked upon in a negative fashion in the past, after the release of this movie, it was now ten times worse. Suddenly, the Ouija board went from being a mystical board game to an evil contraption of dark forces and a doorway to demonic evil, if that's how you see it. Um, another reason that the board was now seen in this light was due to the Exorcist movie apparently being based on actual real events that actually happened to a young boy in Maryland in 1949 who had been introduced to the Ouija board by his aunt, who was a fan of spiritualism. The boy's aunt died shortly after introducing him to the Ouija board and apparently that's when the boy became possessed. Um, William Peter Blatty, the author of The Exorcist, claims he took the info from this case, changed the characters and built a story around the facts for his 1971 book. In the story, the boy's name is Roland Doe, although this is a pseudonym. He's also been named Robbie Mannheim. Now, as I said before, the story is said to be based on true events, and I think it's a perfect way to end today's episode by uh, retelling the story that probably is responsible for giving the Ouija board its connection with demonic possession and evil intent. And in the story, I will be referring to the boy as Roland. Uh, As I said, it was 1949. Roland's grandmother, who introduced him to the Ouija board, had just passed away. This is when the possession started to take hold. The boy was only 14 years old. The boy started to complain that scratching noises, dripping pipes and strange noises were coming from every part of his bedroom and his bed would start to move and violently shake, just like in the movie. And also, household objects were witnessed being thrown by unseen forces when the boy was near. The boy's family eventually seeked help for all the paranormal happenings in the house. They desperately needed help and the boy's mind seemed to be slipping further and further away as the days went on. And help did arrive in the form of doctors, ministers and psychiatrists, but unfortunately none were able to offer any help. The family originally seeked help from their own pastor, Luther Miles Schulz. Schulz was fascinated with parapsychology and asked if he could keep the boy at his house overnight to observe the strange things that had been occurring, and apparently that night Schulz did indeed witness objects flying across the room and the boy's strange behaviour got worse. Knowing that this was out of his league, Shull suggested that the family seek out the help of a Catholic priest. Enter Edward Hughes, a Roman Catholic priest who would go on to perform the first of many exorcisms on the boy. The boy's condition had worsened and he was being kept at Georgetown University Hospital. It seemed necessary that the boy should be restrained, so he was strapped down to the bed to prevent any harm from happening to him. During the exorcism that was performed by the priest Edward Hughes, the boy somehow managed to free his arm from the restraints. He reached under the mattress, pulled loose one of the bed springs, and then slashed at the priest's arm, cutting him from elbow to wrist. The exorcism was ended immediately, as the priest was in desperate need of stitches. Shortly after, the boy received scratch marks all over his body, which was said to be coming from unseen forces. One of the scratches spelled out the word Lewis. When Roland's mother saw that the scratch marks spelled out Lewis, she somehow came to the conclusion that they needed to travel to St. Louis, where they had family living there. The family eventually arrived at their relative St. Louis home, and it wasn't long before they contacted Father Walter H. Halloran and Reverend William Bowden. These two men would once again attempt an exorcism on the boy with help of assistance, but not one exorcism, but one of many. Bowden and Halloran did report that during the day the boy did seem somewhat normal, and it was only when the night came and he was placed in bed that the activity would begin. More reports were made of objects flying through the air, thrown by an unknown force. The boy apparently slipped in and out of trance-like states and made strong guttural sounds that seemed impossible that they could come from him. Also, the scratches on the boy's skin also appeared more and more as the many exorcisms took place. This also included a scratch on the boy's thigh in the shape of a pitchfork and the shape or letter X on his chest possibly a Roman numeral. This led many to believe that the boy was being possessed by not one demon, but ten. The exorcism continued, but it seemed no positive outcome was showing. Roland began spurting out foul language, lashing out more and more, and urinating in his bed. At this point, the parents, being at their wit's end, decided to admit Roland into a hospital once again. 
It's in this hospital that the story, fact or fiction, comes to an end. It was on April the 18th.